In the previous episode, we actually stepped away from vacuum tubes for a little bit and took a look at what I think is a really interesting little chip, the Motorola MC14500B. And what I really want to do with this chip is I want to rebuild it with vacuum tubes. I think that would be awesome. But uh, as we saw with my kind of gate level design of it, is it's massive. It is a huge undertaking. I'm talking probably somewhere on the order of a hundred vacuum tubes just to recreate this little chip, which on the scale of processors is is minuscule because we saw something like the SAP-1 is going to push us well into the several hundreds of vacuum tubes to do. So uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun trying to rebuild this uh, Motorola chip. But uh, just jumping into it straight away, there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of things that we need to figure out first. And so I decided that it would probably be best to start with something much smaller, like a proof of concept. And so we came up with this uh, little design that uses around 12 vacuum tubes. And uh, that's, that's going to be a lot easier and a lot more manageable, but it's going to help us answer some burning questions. And uh, the, the two questions that I want to answer today are about the filament heaters for our D flip-flop because the D flip-flop uses six tubes and well up to now we've been powering our heaters uh, by putting them in series and running 24 volts through them and well that only works with four tubes and so now we have six so how are we going to handle that uh, and then the other thing I want to take a look at is uh, debouncing so that's not going to be a problem for this particular design, but looking forward into the future, debouncing is definitely something that we're going to need to implement on the bigger version, especially when we're uh, potentially progressing through the program that we make one step at a time. So this smaller proof of concept is an excellent opportunity to tackle this. So that's the two things that I want to look at today. So let's hop over the bench and get started. Okay, so first things first, this is the logic diagram for our proof of concept, and it's pretty simple. We just have a logic unit here on the left and a D flip-flop here on the right. And uh, this logic unit is kind of a miniaturized version of the logic unit that we'll ultimately be using in the, the replica of the chip. Uh, but it's, it's enough to give us kind of an idea. And then this D flip-flop is essentially equivalent to the results register in the, the actual Motorola chip. And I want to start with this uh, D flip-flop here. And so... This is how we built this D flip-flop before. And you can see, it's a little difficult to see because there's not circles around the tubes, but there's, there's six uh, tubes being used here. And actually when we built it, we ended up using uh, dual triodes. So we only ended up using three tubes, but the 6DG8 dual triode that we used is just way too expensive of a tube to use in large numbers. So I'm going to build this out of six AU6s. Now the schematic will end up being exactly the same for the six AU6. The only difference will be that the screen grid on each six AU6 will have an additional 100 ohm resistor pulling it up to 24 volts. And then the suppressor grid is going to be tied to uh, ground. And so there's really only one extra connection that we need to think about with doing it with 6AU6s, except that the 6AU6 only has one pentode in it. So instead of being able to do it as three dual triodes, we're going to have to do it as six individual pentodes. And this isn't a huge problem when we're talking about building it, but there is a slight issue in how do we power the heaters because I'm building this entire thing without using a separate six volt power supply for the heater. And so I have a couple ideas and I want to test them out today. And so uh, let's go ahead and pull the breadboard out and take a look at that. All right, so I've got my D flip-flop set up here on my breadboard and you'll notice that we're actually missing two tubes back here. And that's because these are the two tubes that I want to do my testing on. These uh, four tubes up here are just our regular 6AU6 tubes and the heaters for these are running in series off of 24 volts. So the heaters that we need to figure out are just these two tubes back here. And so I have three solutions that I want to try out and they all have their pros and cons. And so I want to kind of take some measurements and look at the pros and cons of each one and then make a decision as to what we're ultimately going to end up running in the, the big version. And so the first solution that I want to test is this, this little tube right here. And uh, you'll notice that it looks pretty much identical to the 6AU6 here. And that's because it is almost completely identical to the 6AU6 with the exception of the heater. This is a 12AU6. It's 
the exact same, should perform the same. It just needs 12 volts on the heater, which is perfect. We've got two tubes and 24 volts. That's, uh, that's the perfect voltage drop that we're looking for. So we'll go ahead and plug these in and then uh, take a quick measurement and see how they, uh, see how they do. All right, these two tubes are actually just the SR flip-flop portion of our edge trigger D flip-flop here. So they could uh, really just initialize into any state at all. It's totally random. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to make sure that our data here is zero and I'm going to toggle the clock. And then I want to measure what our logic low output is coming off of this tube here. So yeah, there we go. Look at that. That's about uh, four and a half volts. That's a really good logic low. All right, so let's put some data on the, the data input and toggle the clock. And man, yeah, look at that. Our logic high bounced all the way up to 17 volts, maybe up to 17 and a half volts. That's a really good swing between logic low and logic high. So the 12AU6 looks like it should be the no-brainer choice here, but there, there is a con to it. There is a uh, fundamental flaw with it, and that's just that I don't have all that many of them. I only have about six or so. Uh, and that would be fine for the little proof of concept that we're building, but for the larger version, the full replica of the MC14500, well, I just, I don't have enough. And uh, searching on eBay, they're not very cheap. So it seems like they're not nearly as common as the 6A6 here. So I wanna take a look at using potentially a different tube in here. And this looks to be the best candidate. This again, visually looks pretty much identical to the 6A6, but it's a little bit different. This is a 12BA6. Uh, it's still a sharp cutoff pentode and it has a 12 volt heater. So it looks like it could be a good alternative to the 12AU6 there. So we're gonna pop those 12AU6 tubes out and then we're gonna put these 12BA6s in there and give them a measure. All right, and I've got these tubes actually out of just a random tube lot and whoever had the tube before me uh, decided to label it with a piece of tape here. And I, I hate this. It leaves a terrible residue on the tube if you try to remove it. And whatever was written on there has long since disappeared. And so it just kind of ruins the aesthetic of the tube. Uh, but it shouldn't affect the operation of the tube in any way at all. So let's put a zero on our data input and toggle the clock and see what our logic low is using the 12BA6 here. Well, there we go. Look at that. The logic low is actually really close to the 12AU6. We're at five volts, maybe up to five and a quarter to five and a half. That's really good logic low. That's impressive. All right. Well, that's good. That's good. Let's, uh, let's put a logic high onto our data input and toggle the clock. Well, we're, we're a little lower. Before we were at like 17 to 17 and a half. Here we're at about 15 and a half. And you know, I could probably get away with using these. Uh, but there, there is a slight con, there is a slight drawback to these. And again, that's just that I, I don't have too many of these. I have about twice as many of, as I do of the 12AU6, but uh, I just, you know, I don't have a huge number of these. And also that logic high of just about 15 volts if we start stacking these up and having D flip-flops feeding into other D flip-flops, that could potentially start to cause some issues. All right, so the final solution that I wanna look at is actually just using the 6AU6. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, this orange wire is the 24 volts that's feeding into the heaters here. So I'm just gonna disconnect that and I'm gonna remove these tubes and put the 6AU6s back in. Okay, so I've got the 6AU6s back in, but I haven't hooked the heaters up to anything. And that's because if I hook it up to 24 volts, I'm just gonna burn the heaters out. Uh, but I also have a minus 12 volt rail over here. And well, six volt heaters with equal amperage across them and 12 volts, that's a six volt drop across each one. So that should power it. Let's plug that into there. All right, now just out of curiosity, we, we know that this should perform pretty much identical to the, the 12AU6. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna double check it right quick just to see. Yeah, yeah, about uh, five volts there. 
yeah, about five volts, maybe five and a half volts. Yeah, and all the way up to about 17 to 17 and a half volts. So we can see that the 6AU6 and the 12AU6 perform pretty much identically, which is fantastic news. Uh, but the drawback of using the 6AU6 off of the negative 12 volt rail here is that the negative 12 volt rail is usually only used for negative biasing of the grid, which means that it draws pretty much no power at all. So the negative 12 volt supply can be made really, really, really small, like on the order of, you know, two or 300 milliamps. But once we start powering tube heaters off the negative 12 volt supply, we have to build a bigger, more powerful 12 volt supply for our, our circuit. And well, I like the idea of, of having a really small 12 volt supply and just having a large 24 volt supply be the primary supply for everything. But uh, I think it's a lot easier to, to get a beefy 12 volt supply than it is to try and source a bunch of these 12 BA6s or 12 AU6s. And also, I really like the idea of using the exact same tube for every single tube in the entire thing. I think it would be awesome if we could build the entire MC14500 out of just 6A6 tubes. That way, if a tube goes bad or if we, we have a problem with one of the tubes, you can just pop it out and pop another one exactly like it in. I think that's really cool. So I think that's the solution that I'm going to go with. I'm going to use the negative 12 volt rail to power 6AU6s, the, the two here on the end. Uh, and I'm just ultimately when we build the power supply for the big one, we're just going to have to build a beefier 12 volt power supply. But uh, that's, a, that's a solution that I'm, I'm happy with. I think that's the one we'll run with. So uh, that's awesome. We've, we figured out one of the burning questions that I had. So the, the next question is how are we going to handle debounce? So let's take a look at that. All right, in order to properly see what the problem of bounce is, as well as debouncing that, we need to pull out our nice oscilloscope, which has a storage function on it. So we've got this hooked up with channel one, which is the uh, yellow line here. It's hooked up to the output of our just regular old standard inverting amplifier, which is using a 6AU6 here. And then this purple line here is channel two, and that's hooked up to the button. And so the way this works is that whenever I push the button, that puts 24 volts through a 22,000 ohm resistor uh, that goes to a 33,000 ohm to negative 12 and a 4.7 thousand ohm to the grid. This is just like the standard regular old plain Jane inverting amplifier that we've been using for uh, pretty much everything. Now what bounce is, is when I push this button, sometimes the contacts don't hit and stay hit. They'll hit and bounce a little bit. And that can cause issues. That can cause uh, a flip-flop to flip multiple times or the clock to count multiple clock cycles while we're working on something. And this can be incredibly frustrating. So let's see if we can see that bouncing problem on the scope here. There we go. Look at that. We got some nasty bounce out of it on just our third or fourth shot there. That's wild. Let's see if we can zoom in on that a little bit. Yeah, look at the bounce there. That's crazy. So this was the, the bounce coming into pressing it. And then when I released it, we got a big bounce coming off of the release as well. So you can see that our, our output has several spikes in it. And so this could, this could be counted as uh, several different button presses through here, which is, would just be horrible. That's just, that's nasty, nasty bounce. So what's the solution for this? Well, it turns out it's pretty simple. I mean, you can see just by looking at this already that there was a little bit of bounce here and the tube didn't even register it. So the, the tube itself is pretty resilient to bounce, although this is really, really nasty bounce that we're seeing here. But we can pretty much eliminate all of this by just adding a capacitor to the grid. And we just add, I've got a little, uh, I think this is a one nanofarad capacitor here. It's, and we'll just put that coming off of the, the 4.7 thousand ohm resistor to, to ground there. And so that little capacitor just goes in that junction between the 22,000 ohm resistor, the 33,000 ohm, and the 4.7 thousand ohm resistor. That little triple junction right there, we're just putting that little one nanofarad capacitor to, to ground there. Now, let's, uh, let's take another shot here and see what that looks like. There we go, right off the bat. Again, you can see that we got some pretty nasty bounce out of it. 
I mean, let's see, I can zoom in a little more here. Yeah, look at that bounce. That's pretty disgusting looking bounce there uh, on the, the down press there. But you can see that the tube pretty much just ignores it because that, that capacitor is just absorbing all of this difference here. It's, it's charging up. And then uh, that's when finally a little bit later is when the tube starts to transition. And you get a really nice, smooth transition out of it. How cool is that? Let's do another shot here. All right, well, we didn't get as much bounce. I mean, you can still see we got a little bit of, of tiny little bounce right here at the beginning, but that probably wouldn't affect it anyways. But you can see that that's, that's definitely the delay there. So if this delay actually ends up becoming too long, we can just run a, a smaller capacitor, something that, that balances the bounce that we're seeing with uh, response time that we're getting here. So really, this, this capacitor is just a random one that I, that I grabbed out of the bucket. I didn't size this in particularly. I just wanted to demonstrate this. And then actually, that, that seems to work really well right here. Yeah, look at that, man. Look at the, look at the nasty bounce here. And the, the tube just, just ignores it. So there we go. That's, that's awesome. That's epic. We, we managed to create the simplest debounce circuit ever. And it just is just a simple capacitor added uh, on the grid input. And that pretty much eliminates any issues that we would get from bounce. That's, that's super, super cool. It should also be noted that the idea of just putting this capacitor on the grid to essentially get rid of, of bounce is, is not something that I, I just kind of came up with. Uh, this is actually a kind of pared down version of the way IBM handled uh, debouncing. And actually the best way to understand how debouncing was handled on old vacuum tube computers is to check out Curious Mark's video. Uh, Curious Mark has one of the best YouTube channels I've come across. And he goes into this fantastic deep dive on powering up an old module from an IBM vacuum tube computer. And it, it ends up being a key debouncing bouncer after they reverse engineer the entire thing. It's a wonderful video. If you haven't seen any of Curious Mark's stuff, stop watching this right now and go to his channel and watch all of his stuff. It's all fantastic. All right, and so on our long road to building our little proof of concept uh, design here, we've already answered two questions that I was particularly worried about. And that is, how are we gonna power the heaters in the D flip-flop? And uh, how are we gonna solve bouncing issues for buttons that I'm pushing? And it turns out that uh, those were both pretty simple things to solve. And so there's still a few more problems to tackle, but uh, I think this, just looking at the difference here and the nasty bounce is so much fun that I'm I'm gonna just keep playing with this in the oscilloscope for a little while longer uh, because it's, it is quite a lot of fun. Oscilloscopes are fun. You guys, if you don't have an oscilloscope, you should get an oscilloscope. They're, they're awesome. Uh, but thank you guys so much for watching and uh, we'll, we'll see y'all in the next episode. Yeah, look at that. That's, how cool is that? Oh man. All right, see you guys.